started. Um, so this is functional interactive design. Uh, I don't know if the FID tag is taken on Twitter. I, I, I've never actually checked, but if you combine that with Google Colorado and tweet some uh, some feedback, that I, uh, if I can search for it later. Uh, my Twitter handle is Laura's there. Um, and welcome your input. This is the first time I'm presenting on this topic. So uh, I welcome any and all input, even if you hate it, especially if you hate it. So um, my name is Laura Scott, and I am uh, president and creative director of King Vision. I've been uh, designing websites since 95. Uh, back in the Netscape days, uh, designing DVDs since 2001, uh, working in Drupal since 2004. Uh, that was Drupal 4 and 5. Boy, has it changed a lot since then. Um, and uh, I uh, went to school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my uh, experience in computers started with watching 2001 and Star Trek when I was little. Um, in seventh grade, we did punch cards uh, with archaic machines. We actually used paper clips and punched out holes based on certain patterns and then ran them through card readers so we could do like math problems, very basic math problems. Um, in college, I studied Pascal, um, and that was about it in terms of studying uh, computer programming in college. Uh, I used the IBM mainframe. I don't remember what the acronym was, but you had to do inline styling uh, for printed documents. It was very much like HTML, except it was a completely different syntax. Uh, I worked on one paper that was 20 pages long, and on the second page, I missed a close tag on an underline. And back then, you had to sit at a workstation, and you'd walk across campus to the print center to pick up your printout. And on page two, you see that the rest of your your uh, essay is underlined. So you have to go back and log in and do it all over again. Um, so HTML is, a, is actually a, an easy transition. Um, when I was flying to grad school, I used a friend's Macintosh. It was back when it was a little toaster. And, uh, but I used DOS uh, pretty much since then, uh, from, from school on into uh, working in the the video, television, film industry. Um, Macs just sucked. They they were single threaded. They crashed a lot, and the Windows machines were outperforming them. And Windows NT, still one of the, the most rock solid platforms out there, um, and really loved it. But uh, OS 10 came out, and uh, since 2002, I've been on Macs, and I really haven't looked back. Every time I have to sit down at a Windows machine. Um, so let's talk about what this session is not about. This session is not about theming or CSS or HTML or PHP, tips and tricks in, in working with Drupal theming. Uh, that's not what this is about. There's some fabulous sessions here about it, and I recommend that you seek them out because there are some very excellent people presenting at this conference. Um, this isn't about beauty for beauty's sake. We're not going to say, ooh, look at how pretty this website is. And this is not the be all end all of design. You know, um, this is just some thoughts, observations I've had, you know, things I've learned. I'm a student in this topic, um, lifetime student in this topic. And what's really exciting about this world we're working in is that we're reinventing it every day. Um, we don't know what the internet's going to be like three years from now. But what we do know is that interactive design needs to be functional. And this is what this is about. And so this is where I'm just going to ramble about uh, a bit about this topic. Um, if you find this topic interesting in any way, I recommend you see Lori Lamar's uh, session tomorrow. I don't know exactly what she's covering, but it's a very similar kind of topic from the description. And, uh, and definitely uh, check it out. So let's get into it. What is functional interactive design? Um, it's, it, it actually kind of sounds like a, a silly question. Um, it's design that serves a function. And what does that mean? It means that it's design that is usable, design that works.
functional design serves the user. It is there for us to use. The design helps us use what it is. It's easy to understand. This is pretty universal, no matter where you go in the world. A little dark here, but the red and green buttons. Up and down, up above, down, if it was upside down. If it was red button on the top and green button on the bottom, what would you do? I don't know. Um, if there was no color, you'd know what to do. And if they were side by side and you had only the color to go by, you'd know what to do. Uh, functional design is something that you can at least figure out. I don't know how many you remember the first time you encountered a water cooler that had a child-proof hot water spigot. <laughs> and you're, what the heck is this? And you're trying to figure it out, but you figure it out. And, and after a while, you don't really think about it. Sometimes, functional design can be a bit unusual. <laughs> this was at the MIT Hotel in uh, Boston, in Cambridge. Uh, I was out there for a design for Drupal, and I went into the bathroom and looked in the shower, and there was a shower head like this. Um, what was funny was that uh, it actually gave a very nice shower. It, it, the, the streams converged into one stream. It wasn't two parallel streams. So it was well engineered, and it actually ended up being a wonderful experience. Um, I don't think it would work in Colorado where we have a water shortage, but out in Boston, where I guess it's not really a big issue. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, let's see. Um, how many of you have uh, read Blink or heard Malcolm Gladwell speak? A few of you? Uh, well, one of the things that he talks about is the story of the Herman Miller Heron chair, and I'll just give you a real thumbnail, is that Herman Miller came up with this design for this chair, and the whole idea was that it served function, not convention. And that meant it had all kinds of adjustment. It has padded arms that are attached to the back of the seat, not the, the bottom of the seat, so that you lean back and the arms move with you, that they are adjustable sideways. Um, and it has this mesh that took real, some real engineering to get it so that it didn't pinch people when they got up in the chair. It doesn't stretch. It ends up being a very solid mesh. Very proud of the chair. Took it out uh, to the, the B2B markets, and everybody hated it. The designers hated it. The business buyers hated it. But uh, Herman Miller believed in the chair, and so they pushed it out there, and within two years, it was the number one selling business chair. Um, Today, everybody wants one. Why? Because they function so well. And now when you see these chairs, they're beautiful. The functionality of the chair has changed our perception of how attractive it looks. It was really a funny looking chair when it first came out. People said, that's ridiculous. You know? And uh, now it's, it's become the standard. Here's an example of another uh, functional chair. This was at MIT in the classrooms. Um, it's shaped to fit the human body. It was very comfortable. The holes keep you cool. It's lightweight, easy to move. The handle in the back also makes it easy to move, and they stack. And it's a nice color. So this, I thought, was really a beautiful chair. Um, functional design has been changing other areas. This is a long wheelbase recumbent bicycle. This is my bike. And I tell you, I get a lot of looks, even today, when I ride this around. And recumbent has been around for at least 15 years. I don't know when they actually started, but I saw them in New York uh, in the early 90s. And uh, um, you know, so they're not that unusual. And there are some people we, uh, in Denver and Boulder who ride them, but it's not very often. And there's still people who look and they just can't believe what they're looking at. But I got to tell you, this is the most comfortable ride I've ever been on. This is